this is Dr. John Shumpert. I'm a board certified occupational and environmental medicine physician here at Resources for Environmental and Occupational Health. And today I'm going to be talking about the uses and abuses of independent medical evaluations. For my uh, disclosures, uh, possible conflicts of interest, I am a contractor for the Montana State Fund and Montana Municipal Interlocal Authority. I perform telephonic evaluations and medical record reviews for these entities. So as an overview of my presentation today, I hope to convey to you situations when uh, one would not want to get an independent medical evaluation and also situations where there are several reasons why an independent medical evaluation should be obtained. In addition, I'll outline some of the limitations of an independent medical evaluation and convey to you what at least I think constitutes a good independent medical evaluation report. So why shouldn't you get an independent medical evaluation? One reason that comes to mind is that it's too early. This might be the case if you haven't actually asked the treating physician for information you'd otherwise get from an independent medical evaluation, such as causation for the injury or occupational disease or maximum medical improvement or an impairment rating. Another reason uh, might not want to get an independent medical evaluation is if the injured worker is still receiving post-surgical or post-hospitalization care. That might be physical therapy, it might be cognitive speech therapy, it might be burn care. Finally, another reason to at least wait on an independent medical evaluation is if you don't have a complete set of medical records. It severely limits the scope of an independent medical evaluation if there are no medical records for the evaluator to rely upon. Another reason to reconsider not getting an IME is if the only provider that you have available to you is the wrong specialty for the particular case. And I've given you some examples that I've experienced in my career. Um, one that I am asked not infrequently is if a particular psychological disorder is related to a particular physical injury. I'm not trained to perform psychometric tests or to provide uh, opinions on psychological diagnoses, so it's outside of my wheelhouse. I have seen psychologists asked to weigh in on maximum medical improvement for physical conditions such as low back pain. I have seen physiatrists ask about causation in the case of uh, um, noise-induced hearing loss. This is outside their wheelhouse. Another example is when the orthopedist is asked about a pulmonary condition. I think that everyone would agree that a pulmonary pulmonary condition should actually go to an internal medicine physician at least, if not a pulmonologist. Another reason to consider at least deferring an independent medical evaluation is if the injured worker has left the state of Montana. The reason for this is that if you get that independent medical evaluation out of state, that provider of the evaluation may be operating with rules that are different from those used in the state of Montana. And if that's the case, then what they consider to be an aggravation or an exacerbation or a maximum medical improvement might not hold up under Montana law. And if you plan to litigate this case and you need that independent medical evaluation to do litigation, then you might wanna consider actually transporting that injured worker back to the state of Montana for the independent medical evaluation so that you know the evaluator is using Montana rules. And another reason when you should consider not getting an independent medical evaluation is when it's too late. This happens somewhat commonly where the independent medical evaluation is scheduled and between the time it's scheduled and the time it actually occurs, things that were to be addressed in the independent medical evaluation uh, happen. So the most common one is when you are looking for medical necessity or appropriateness for a surgery, and the surgery's already taken place by the time the independent medical evaluation occurs. 
Another is when you are looking for maximum medical improvement or an impairment rating, and it's already been given to you by either another IME provider or by the treating physician. Uh, in these cases, it's probably better just to cancel the evaluation and move on. So why should you get an IME? Usually, an IME is requested when there is a need for a well-reasoned answer to a complex set of questions. Another reason is to obtain a second opinion. And it might be a second opinion concerning the diagnosis. It might be a second opinion concerning treatment. It might be an opinion concerning treatment that is outside what is allowed in the utilization and treatment guidelines. You might get an independent medical evaluation because you have a person who needs an impairment rating that's uh, about a complex issue, like a complex shoulder injury or a knee replacement, or they have complex regional pain syndrome. All of these usually require physical examination to complete, and that would be a reason for getting the IME. Finally, there might be an injured worker who um, believes that they are no longer capable of working, that they are permanently and totally disabled. And for that reason, you send them for an IME to confirm or exclude that possibility. As you can see, there are other reasons for getting an IME. One is if multiple body parts are involved. This can occur when a person has a single injury, such as a fall from a tall ladder and hits their head and breaks their neck and tears the rotator cuff and has some rib fractures and maybe has a pelvic fracture. Um, and you are asking about further care and maximum medical improvements and you have a lot of issues to address and perhaps a lot of impairment ratings to assign. It may be because there are multiple claims involved. I see this a lot when a person has worked at one employer for many years and has been injured or developed multiple occupational diseases, and these need to be sorted out. Multiple insurers might be involved as well, subrogation, where an employee has worked at a company that has uh, switched from one insurer to another and the employee may have uh, filed a claim under either of those insurers, and now they get to dicker on who's responsible for care for that uh, particular claim. Another reason to get an IME, as we talked about before, is to figure out causation. Is the person suffering from an occupational disease for which employment can be traced as the major contributing cause? Another reason, though, is when uh, the person is claiming an injury, but no one saw it happen, and there's, there's no evidence at all of an injury anywhere, and uh, they have physical complaints, and they tie it to a particular incident at work, and you need to know if the person's description of the injury actually fits with the actual objective findings that are observed at the time of uh, the evaluation. Obviously, if you're anticipating litigation, you need to get the IME. You need to have a good, solid IME. If there are extensive medical records or if it's a really old date of injury, I see this a lot. I still see dates of injury from the 1990s and every once in a while, someone from the 1980s. Third party lawsuits are another reason. And for this, it's usually actually the IME is used by all the attorneys that are lined up for that third party lawsuit. So an example of this is one where I, I had a, a gentleman who had, had multiple injuries from a fall from a ladder and I was called in for a deposition. And here's a room full of attorneys and each of them asked me if I had anything to say about the ladder, either the hinges or the wood or the metal or the construction or the design. And they were all defending all of those different companies that had contributed to the construction of this ladder. They didn't really care about the work comp claim, but they relied upon the IME for the actual understanding of the injury. And then final reason that uh, I see a lot of is when uh, there is a concern for aggravation of a pre-existing condition. 
And probably the most common one that we see is a person who had a meniscus tear, had a partial meniscectomy, and now three or five or 10 years have gone by and their knee is all degenerated and they need a total knee replacement. And they're saying their knee was permanently aggravated by kneeling or squatting or some other mechanism. And, and they're, they're saying it's a permanent aggravation, not a new injury, and it's related to that meniscectomy that also occurred at work. IMEs are limited in the types of information they can provide you with. One of the things an IME provider cannot do easily is detect when an injured worker is being deceptive or being truthful. And this is particularly the case if there are no supporting medical records to help sort that out. Past injuries and medical problems may be misrepresented, um, and it's really difficult without those medical records to address things like exacerbations and aggravations. You don't know when the injured worker is being honest or simply doesn't know the details of their past. And this is particularly the case when that past medical history occurred when they were a child. They might not have even known why they were in the hospital, despite the fact that the medical records document a significant surgery or some other significant condition. So medical record quality really varies, and this really matters. Um, one of the things that I really clue in on is not just what the medical records say, but who is saying it. So if I have a person with a shoulder injury and I have a medical record from a family medicine physician and another one from the, an orthopedic surgeon, I'm gonna give far greater credence to that orthopedic surgeon's take on what's going on with that shoulder than I will the family medicine physician. So it isn't just the medical specialty, but it's also the knowledge of the medical condition that is inserted into that medical record and provides the evaluator uh, with the kind of information needed to sort out uh, what's going on with that person that they're seeing for the IME. There are a lot of reasons why an injured worker either cannot or will not understand or tolerate the cognitive and physical demands of an IME. Um, they may have forgotten their glasses or they don't understand English. And so when we have forms like the quick dash used for doing upper extremity impairment ratings or um, the Oestry um, pain uh, disability uh, questionnaire or um, any of these forms, uh, they may decide that they can't do them or they need an interpreter or they need the evaluator to read them and explain them to them. Sometimes that works, and sometimes by doing that, you invalidate the um, data you get from that questionnaire. Obviously, if the person doesn't speak English, you need an interpreter. If the person has some cognitive impairments, like they've had a head injury, and so they don't really understand the questions you're asking them as you take the, uh, the history from them, or if they are elderly, it is not uncommon at all to see someone in their 80s that has a lot of medical issues and that impair their cognitive performance. Obviously also, if the person has a significant psychological disorder uh, from the past, I have evaluated people who have schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, and uh, drug addiction. All of those color how they will answer questions and respond to a physical examination in an IME. And then finally, if the person has uh, significant disabilities, such as they're wheelchair bound, or they require crutches, or they're blind or hearing impaired, all of these things also enter into the kind of quality information you're going to get from that IME. One of the most difficult obstacles to overcome as an IME provider is a lack of medical records. This becomes extremely problematic when a case is being litigated and an IME is being planned and the opposing counsel wants details of the IME you plan to do. They may want to know what specific issues will be discussed. 
during the history taking. They might, may want to know what physical examination you will be performing, what areas of the body that you will be touching. They may want to know what types of diagnostic studies you'll either request or order as a part of the IME. And without a complete set of medical records, it's very difficult to answer those sorts of questions. So I'm going to switch gears now and uh, do a little bit of a deep dive into uh, low quality medical records just so that you can look at those medical records that you receive and, uh, if you will, scrutinize them for the kind of information uh, that you should be looking for and certainly that an IME provider will be looking for. One of the things is the description of the injury. Uh, often all I have in the medical record is a statement that the body part is painful or dysfunctional and that the injured worker said that it was caused by work. Sometimes the history will include a wrong description of the injury, or at least the injury is described differently than uh, the description in the first report of injury. Sometimes there will be multiple providers all having different descriptions of how the injury worked. Sometimes one provider will give you one body part like the right shoulder, and another provider will say it's the left shoulder, and you're confused about which shoulder actually is uh, involved. Often there'll be no description of the job duties, and this is the case in an occupational disease eval, other than it was repetitive. Um, so no cycle time. Uh, the UNT guidelines um, consider something repetitive if you are doing it um, over and over uh, in cycle times of less than 30, six, 30 seconds duration. Um, in terms of occupational diseases, we really like to see uh, images of the workstation or some form of description of the workstation. Often that's lacking. If there's a motor vehicle collision, it's nice to see the accident report. It's nice to see pictures of the vehicles after the crash. Um, and on this other thing here, surveillance video, if you have it, I really, really recommend you give it to the uh, um, evaluation provider so that they can look at it and see what it shows and if it actually supports the injured worker's statements about their disability or their um, inability to uh, function in some fashion. Um, another thing that's really difficult to overcome is if there's no time of injury job description or job analysis. Um, and this is particularly the case when an occupational disease evaluation has been requested. For me, electronic medical records are my bane. Um, in those types of records, um, everything from the last visit is uh, inserted into the current visit. And so you have to sort through it uh, to find what is going on now. Um, the first several paragraphs may be just summarizing or recapitulating what was uh, documented in the last five or six visits. Um, sometimes, and I've seen this happen, um, there will be several months worth of records that have exactly the same information in them. And the only difference between one visit and the next is the date at the top of the report. Another th problem with electronic medical records uh, is when uh, voice activated software is used um, and there's no effort on the provider, provider's part to edit that report after they've dictated it. So you'll sometimes end up with lines or even paragraphs of what I call word salad. They just don't make sense. You have no idea what was intended to be conveyed. Finally, um, a problem, and I've already spoken about this, no records predating the current condition. Um, this is particularly um, important when you're trying to address uh, questions concerning an aggravation or exacerbation. So medical records typically contain a description of the um, illness, how it came on, the history of present illness, as we call it. Uh, another section in the medical record will document the physical examination. Um, I really like to see some amount of vital statistics on the person. A height and a weight is really helpful. Uh, this is particularly the case when we know that particular height and weight combinations are risk factors for issues. So the, the person that has knee pain and is five foot six and 150 pounds um, is going to have a very different 
presentation in my mind than the person who's five foot six and weighs 350 pounds because we know that morbid obesity is a strong risk factor for knee pain and knee joint degeneration. If there is a poor description of the physical examination that's been performed, so the description will be just that the shoulder was tender and they won't even say which shoulder they examined or where it was tender. Um, or what's worse is when they do a complete physical examination of the person's body and don't mention or don't examine the actual injured body part. See this fairly commonly in primary care providers. Other issues with the physical examination include when uh, tests are inappropriately applied. And so Waddle's tests were originally designed by Professor Waddle of Scotland to determine if a person's low back pain was actually physiologically caused. Dr. Waddle was attempting to determine who actually should have spine surgery when he developed these tests. I've seen Waddle's tests applied to shoulders and knees and the neck. They were never designed to be applied to other body parts. And if you know Waddle's test, you know that they can't be applied to other body parts. Another is when tests are incorrectly interpreted. And so this is when uh, something like a straight leg raise test is performed. The straight leg raise test is looking for radicular pain in the lower extremity. We're looking for numbness, tingling, or pain, lancinating down below the level of the knee, at least, into the foot. And so when you see a straight leg raise test is positive and they mention that it's for back pain, that's actually a negative straight leg raise test, not a positive straight leg raise test. And then another issue with physical examination is when symptoms are described without actually doing a physical examination. So you'll be reading through the history of present illness and they'll describe what the person is feeling and all that. And you get to the physical examination and they just, again, describe what the person is feeling and don't actually touch the person. Although this does contribute to low medical record quality, um, at least the first bullet point in this list is a reason why I am often asked to do an IME, and that's because there's no diagnostics in the records or no diagnostics were done. The person's been treated with over-the-counter anti-inflammatories and, and maybe not even physical therapy for months, and they still complain of pain, and no one's referred them on or got x-rays or got an MRI or anything. Um, and so they've just kind of sat on them and waited to see, well, you'll get better uh, when the, and the person doesn't. Another problem with diagnostics is when they are done, but they're inappropriately interpreted. And so the treating decides a disc bulge is actually a disc herniation. Um, or a treating decides there's fraying of the rotator cuff and they decide to interpret that as a complete rotator cuff tear. Those are inaccurate and often lead to inappropriate use of surgery. And then the other is when no diagnostics are done to exclude other sources of the complaints. And in this case here, in this example, I use a, a carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome can be caused by a lot of things, including pregnancy, low thyroid function, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis. And so, you know, you need to re rule those kinds of conditions out before you can say that the, the major contributing cause is something other than a pre-existing condition. It still doesn't say that work was the cause of the carpal tunnel syndrome, but it certainly has ruled out the known non-work-related causes of the condition. And then finally, something that you need to know about IME providers, we're not all created equal. I was trained to not review imaging studies, and I don't. I was not trained to review them. Um, I was trained where I trained at the University of Minnesota. We were trained to rely on the radiologists uh, for reading of MRIs and x-rays and to not try to rely on our own expertise. And so I don't do that. But there are plenty of uh, IME providers, orthopedic surgeons uh, are probably the ones that most come to mind that um, as a part of their training learn to read x-rays and MRIs and to interpret them and then go into the operating room and use them to find their way around the uh, the person's shoulder or their low back or their knee or whatever. And so you need to find out from that IME provider if they want the raw images or just the reports. If they want the raw images and you can get them, please provide them to that IME 
provider. It will be very helpful. As I said earlier, one of the reasons to get an IME is if you need an impairment rating. So although a lot of people believe, and there are companies out there that um, advertise that they can do impairment ratings on anyone, on any condition with just a file review and just send us your records online and we'll do the impairment rating for you. But I really disagree with that assessment, and that's because the AMA Guide 6th edition requires a fair amount of information that you can only get from the individual. Every impairment rating that is based upon a particular diagnosis requires that you do a thing called a functional history adjustment, which means you have to actually ask the person about their symptoms, or at least administer questionnaires that give you an idea uh, that you can score and then get an idea of how they are doing in terms of their symptoms. Um, many of the um, diagnosis-based impairment ratings also require some form of physical examination so that you can do the physical examination adjustment. And it may be um, an adjustment for range of motion. It may be an adjustment for palpatory findings. It may be an adjustment because they have certain provocative test findings that are important for the impairment rating. And then finally, there are many impairment ratings that require diagnostics tests in order to complete. So if it's a pulmonary disorder, all of those require some form of pulmonary function test. If it's a hearing loss claim, they need to have an audiometry uh, evaluation and, and audiometric testing done so that you can do the impairment rating. It's based upon their audiometric test results. The same thing goes for any kind of eye injury that requires fairly high technology ophthalmology testing. And, and honestly, um, the only place that I know that does them reliably is the Marin Eye Center at the University of Utah. I don't know of any place in Montana or in Idaho that does the, the testing um, that is required in the AMA Guide 6th edition. Um, the AMA Guides also requires a certain amount of psychological or neuropsychological testing if you're going to do an impairment rating for any kind of cognitive or psychological condition. Uh, many of the impairments that uh, uh, involve uh, joint degeneration, in particular the knees, require uh, plane radiographs, and then they have to measure the joint space in millimeters so that you can uh, accurately provide an impairment rating. And then this last one, video nystagmography, this is a test to determine if a person uh, who complains of dizziness or vertigo actually has uh, some form of uh, dizziness or vertigo. So I want to discuss detail and objectivity uh, because I think they're important. And this is really getting at what makes a good IME. And I have gone to uh, educational programs where the, the main topic is IMEs, and I've been on panel discussions and talked with people, other people that do IMEs, and, and seen that there's a wide variety among IME providers of what they think makes a good IME. And so you'll have to decide if you buy what I think makes one and or if you think there are other criteria that should uh, actually uh, be used. Uh, one of the things that I look for is a uh, review of the records. Um, there are IME providers that don't feel like they need to actually dictate their review of the medical records. Um, and uh, sometimes they'll just do a minimum uh, review. Uh, there are states in the country where all the IME provider has to, to do is say that they've you know, review the records and that their opinions are based upon their review of the records, but they don't actually have to read through the records and dictate what they got out of the records into their IME report. And the best example I have is one I saw recently of an IME. It was a good three inch binder and the IME was actually about four pages long. Um, and so it's, it's, you got really got to question, you know, just how helpful or useful that IME is. Is there documentation of the history obtained from the injured worker concerning historical events? So, you know, things that I look for, is there a detailed description of the injury? Is there a detailed description of the job duties or the tools they use or the equipment they operate? Is there a clear workstation description if it's an ergonomic issue? Those things I wanna see in the IME um, so that I have a good, at least I feel confident that that person really took that into account. 
And then finally, is there a review of the past medical and surgical history? Again, going back to the, the example of carpal tunnel syndrome, you know, if that person has a long history of rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes, um, then maybe that carpal tunnel syndrome isn't work-related after all. Here are some other issues that I uh, like to review when I have to look at someone else's IME. Um, do they have an analysis of the current symptoms compared to the initial symptoms at the time of injury or at the time that the occupational disease occurred? Um, this is actually uh, another part of the history taking um, that I'm going to use carpal tunnel syndrome as my example. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome typically does not just start abruptly with full-on symptoms. They typically evolve. There's typically minor tingling um, in uh, the thumb or index long and ring fingers, and it becomes more pronounced, uh, and it happens when they are grabbing certain tools, and, um, and then it progresses and becomes more uh, prominent, and maybe they start feeling some weakness in their hand, or maybe after a few months they start having a, a nocturnal awakening. They wake up with their hand numb and tingling, and that actually wakens them from sleep. So you want to see that those kinds of details have been, you know, gotten out of the person so that you have a plausible story to support the assertion that, yes, this is an occupational disease and not some other kind of condition. Um, you want to be able to know if they've done an analysis of past objective findings compared to the current objective findings. So um, one of the things that drives me crazy is when the person I'm seeing had uh, originally elbow pain and somehow it evolved into shoulder pain and now i'm seeing them and they're claiming that it's all about their shoulder and uh, but but they started out with elbow pain and it's because they slammed their elbow against something and you know and somehow in the medical records that progression from elbow to um shoulder wasn't captured and in the past ime it also wasn't captured um and now I'm stuck with, you know, this shoulder has nothing to do with that elbow. You do know that, don't you? And so, um, you know, you like to see that in the IME that people are paying attention to those types of progressions. I really like to see vital signs. I'd like to know their height. I want to know their weight. I want to know, you know, things about them that are more physiologic that give me a little bit of more of a clue of their health status. Um, I know a lot of people don't like, you know, body mass index. I think that it's fairly predictive um, in a non-weight lifting, non-bodybuilding type of person who's got really dense muscles and really, you know, powerfully built, but, you know, they're not obese. They're just really strong, and yes, they're heavy, but, you know, they're strong, and, and you'll see that when you see the person. Um, but the person that's five foot six and 350 pounds and has, uh, wears a 46 waist pants and, uh, you know, that person, and, and has an exercise since high school and now they're in their 60s, you know, that person has a very different health status. And so the vital signs, when you're looking that in the IME, you'd like to be able to see that, to know that that IME provider actually captured that information and, and gets its significance. Also, I get driven crazy by non-contributory physical examination. And this was something that was pounded into me when I was a resident. Um, I started out where I did a residency, we actually had to do IMEs as a part of the residency. And so um, we had our faculty physicians supervising us for the, uh, the IMEs. And one of the first things they broke us of is, you know, looking at their eyes, their ears, their nose, their throat, listening to their chest when the IME is about their knee. Um, they wanted us to focus on the actual subject of the, the IME and not worry about anything else. Um, now, obviously, in this example, if the person has foot swelling and uh, they're coming in with a foot claim, but you think they have congestive heart failure and that's why their foot is swollen, then it's legitimate to listen to their heart and listen to their lungs. But if you don't suspect that they have congestive heart failure or some other reason for a foot swollen foot, then you really ought to stick with the foot. Another problem that I see is when they don't do a complete physical examination. They poke and prod and don't do any kind of provocative testing. So the example I give here is Cousins test. That's where someone has lateral elbow pain, lateral epicondylitis, or lateral epicondylalgia. 
because uh, it really isn't inflamed most of the time, or medial epicondyl alga. Um, did they do the tests where you have the person extend their elbow and bend their wrist backward and then resist against your hand? You know, they try to bend their, hand, their wrist backward while you push their wrist forward into flexion and see if that provokes the pain on the outside of the elbow. That's one of Cousin's tests, and that's for lateral epicondylitis. Um, another one is where they say the person has normal range of motion, but you don't get any numbers to know that they have more normal range of motion, or they are simply estimates. Um, another thing that happens is when they base their opinions on the range of motion, and the range of motion is described as, um, you know, they can bend down to within a foot of the floor, you know, with their hands extended. Um, the AMA guides recommends that you use an inclinometer to actually measure the range of motion, and that's what I do. So measurements are really helpful. They're objective. Uh, limb circumferences, if the person is saying they have atrophy, um, but there's no measurement of the leg, uh, uh, so that you know that it actually is one or two or three centimeters less in circumference compared to the opposite side limb. Um, again, there's no detail. There's no objectivity. Other details you'll want to look for include how the answers you ask are answered. So if the answers you see in your IME aren't supported by anything, not by medical literature, not by some form of logical analysis to support the opinion, um, or only rely on unsubstantiated diagnoses uh, to support the opinion, um, then you know you want to steer clear of that IME. Um, it's not going to be very useful to you. The example I give here is when the IME provider kind of hand waves and says, well, they've got back pain, but they're depressed, and that's the cause of their pain. And the person's never been diagnosed with depression. They've never had uh, any form of psychological testing. They've never had any psychopharmaceutical treatment. It's just the, the way that the IME provider decides that they uh, are not work-related. Uh, another one is when the IME provider says they're malingering. Um, if they don't provide support for that, it's a useless uh, thing to say. Um, another one that drives me nuts is when uh, they uh, immediately diagnose a person with uh, complex regional pain syndrome, CRPS, and again, they don't support it with the objective and the subjective uh, uh, criteria for CRPS. Um, now, although many IME providers don't use medical literature to support their opinion, they do use other resources. Up to date is a great resource. Uh, the Cochrane Collaboration also is a great resource. Uh, PubMed is a great resource. The AMA Guides to Causation is a great resource. So there's lots of other resources that an IME provider may use to support their opinion. And you like to see that in there, because if you ever have to litigate that case, um, that IME provider will be able to look fairly um, strong in their deposition or their testimony. So things to look for in an IME provider, for sure, you want someone that will divulge their financial information when it's requested by legal counsel. That's kind of the standard now. Um, uh, it's, it's just something you gotta do, and it's not really that big of a deal. Um, another one is um, that they need to agree to be deposed or to testify after they do the IME. So the, the doc that swoops in, he's a Navy provider, and he's just doing this on the, on the fly, on the, sh you know, on the side, and then he gets deployed to the Mediterranean, he won't be back for a year. That's probably not somebody you wanna get an IME out of because they're not gonna be available for anything or even follow-up questions. Um, another thing that I like to see, I certainly do it myself, is I admit when I don't understand or don't have the answer to a, a particular question or a question is outside my expertise. And, and so probably the most common ones that I see for myself or when it involves a foot or an ankle, I don't do feet and ankles. And another one is if it's a psych disorder, if it's uh, someone who is claiming that they are suicidal or they have a drug addiction or something and that it's work related, uh, I, I just can't weigh in on those. It's outside of my expertise. Um, another thing that I um, have been the, the recipient of is when another provider has uh, used personal attacks against me to support their own opinion. Um, that's just unprofessional. 
you want to see IME providers that use current medical knowledge, current treatment guidelines, and are aware of current standards of care. So you want IME providers that keep up with uh, you know, current opinion in their area of expertise. So I just want to say a few words about the letter that you write when you request an IME. I strongly suggest that you write the letter before requesting the IME so that you have a clear idea of what you want to know. I think this will also not only inform you um, about the kinds of information you need, you may decide after a while that you uh, need other information and you'll add that to the letter after rereading it. And the other thing that the letter will do is it may actually um, help you figure out what type of uh, medical specialist you want for your IME. You may have thought, gee, I need an occupational physician because I want restrictions. But then after you write the letter, you realize, gosh, most of these questions have to do with nerve issues. So maybe I want a neurologist. Or gee, most of these issues are about the person's uh, the joint and, and causation and aggravation. So maybe I really need an uh, orthopedic surgeon and not an occupational medicine physician. And so you might want to really uh, pay attention to the kinds of information you're going to get from your letter. And again, that means you have to write the letter uh, ahead of time. Something that happens often is that a letter is incomplete and it's sent off as a part of the IME. And then the IME comes back and you realize, gee, I didn't ask that. I didn't ask for an impairment rating, but here they put them at MMI. So now I got to send another letter and ask for uh, an impairment rating. And so you get that and you go, gee, oh, I forgot to ask them. Now I've got all these JAs because they're saying they can't go back to their time of injury employment. So I've got to get these other JAs approved. And all of that could have been done all at once um, if you just anticipated uh, those kinds of issues coming up. Um, and then finally, um, you know, one of the things that is for me at least impossible, maybe other providers can do it, is when I'm asked to evaluate someone for an occupational injury and um, I do that evaluation and, and then I get a letter, you know, days or weeks or months later saying, oh gee, I see that you said that the person doesn't have an injury. Well, do they have an occupational disease? Well, for me, the process of evaluating for an occupational disease is very different from my process when I evaluate someone for an injury. I ask different questions. Um, usually I take a far more extensive history um, and really pay attention to pre-existing conditions and those kinds of things. Uh, and so, you know, for me, if you ask about an occupational disease after the fact, I got to see the person again. So really, really, if you if you want to know about both an injury and an occupational disease, it's really a good idea to ask about both of those issues clearly in the same letter. It's very helpful to document in your letter the condition or conditions you've already accepted because this often is not obvious when uh, the evaluator is reviewing the medical records. The letter really should include all the specific issues you want addressed. If it's aggravations, if it's MMI, if it's restrictions, if it's further treatment, if it's post-MMI treatment, if it's additional diagnostics, if it's referral to a tertiary care facility, if you are asking, if you're wondering about those issues, please put them in the letter. One of the things that we see most commonly is that um, you'll ask for MMI, but you won't ask for an impairment rating or for permanent restrictions. If you're asking for MMI, always ask about an impairment rating and always ask about permanent restrictions. One of the things that virtually no IME provider knows anything about is cost of care. So uh, I, I see it every once in a while where someone will ask about cost of care or cost of future care. Um, and that's something that an IME provider cannot usually provide. Um, there is a type of uh, person, uh, they're called life care planners, um, and they are trained to give you that kind of information, but that's usually outside of the scope of an independent medical evaluation. That ends my portion of uh, this webinar. I'm going to hand it off to Leah Morrow. She is our Chief 
Information Officer, and she will be discussing with you some IME scheduling and administrative issues that most IME practices will have in common.